John chapter 6, verse 1 says, After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, or over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him, because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now, the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? No. But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples then to those sitting down. And likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then the men, when they had seen this sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Will you pray with me, please? What a sweet thing, God, to be able to take this time and set it aside to know you better and understand you better. We recognize, God, that there are different people from different places in their walk with you and their understanding of you. We've all gathered together with this one common goal, this motive right now to to encounter you and to know you better. So Lord, overcome every culture barrier, Lord, over every background that we've had that somehow will flavor or season things in some form of way that would be incorrect. But prepare our hearts and minds, captivate us in your word, draw us to this place where we are so drawn in, where we are so consumed that nothing else matters. And then we'd find ourselves before you and respond appropriately. So we commit this time to redeem every second. Lord, may it not be too, too short or long. Lord, keep it proper in depth and width and length. And we just pray now that you would do your work in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I would say today as I would any, please don't just believe me. Don't just assume it's true because I or anyone, pastor or otherwise, says so. It's amazing how everybody's an expert in everything these days. All they need is a blog site. Well, having said that, use the word of God and use the word of God to test everything that you hear. Do you realize that of the 37 or so miracles that are specifically recorded in the Gospels, only one of them is listed in all four of the Gospels? It's not the healing, though there are about 21 or so of those recorded specifically. It's not deliverance from possession, but we can at least account for five specific mentions of that in Scripture, in the, in the, in the Gospels. It's not even raising the dead, whether that be the widow's son in, uh, the widow's son in Nain, uh, Jairus' daughter, or Lazarus. Not any of those are mentioned in all four of the Gospels. The miraculous catch of fish, the water to wine, walking on water, calming the storms, withering, or the withering of a fig tree. All of those things are recorded in the Gospels, but only one of them is recorded in all of them, and it's this particular miracle we have before us. I find that interesting. I mean, other than the resurrection, which, of course, you can't really have a Gospel without it. And I think of all the things that I would put in all of them, why this one? Focusing on Jesus as king in Matthew, our servant in Mark, as a human being in Luke, and here as God, the Son, how God can show us from every one of those facets how imperative this particular miracle is. Now, let's get a context. <clears throat> Jesus, by the way, according to the other three Gospels, so we have this richness of text, more than we do for any other particular story then in the Gospels, we have a richness of text because we can look at all of the accounts and get information we may not even get in the Gospel of John. By the way, you're probably aware 94% of what John writes in the Gospel of John is original material. It's not going to be found in the other books. And here's what we have in context. Jesus has just found out that John the Baptist was murdered. Now, we get a little bit more of that detail in Matthew and in Mark. 
where, of course, uh, John the Baptist, in essence, had sort of dissed uh, Herod Antipas because he basically ripped off, he nicked his brother's wife. Yeah, that's not a good thing by any means. And he goes after him. And he basically, in a righteous indignation, tells him, hey, it's not right for you to have this, your brother's wife. He doesn't even call him his wife. And for which then this particular Herod Antipas, one of Herod the great sons, well, he's kind of freaked out by the situation, but you've probably heard it. Hell hath no wrath like a woman scorned. I don't agree with that, by the way. Hell hath a wrath that, I mean, I've, I've seen some, scorning, some scorned women, and they're pretty rough, but nothing compared to what the Bible tells us hell is. Nonetheless, she wants John bad, and she wants him dead. So ultimately, she has her daughter dance. John the Baptist is the product of uh, Herod's drunken claims as men tend not to think very brightly when they're intoxicated or anyone does for that matter, and John has been murdered. And Jesus catches wind of that. Now please understand, John is a benchmark for all of Jesus' ministry. <clears throat> John is a, the forerunner. We know him before when John is there baptizing people, preparing them for coming of Jesus, and then Jesus is baptized in essence. It's him and his coming out, so everyone kind of gets this. He emerges from obscurity so that everyone gets him. But you may not know this, but every major f- sort of facet or function of Jesus' ministry is preceded by some major movement by John. So, if you think about it in the simplest sense, John the Baptist emerges, Jesus emerges. John the Baptist is in prison, Jesus moves from baptizing to doing this big public ministry, and then John the Baptist is murdered, and Jesus now turns his sights towards his own murder. So this is a very gripping and a very personal moment for Jesus. Now, John the Baptist isn't just someone that's really cool and he's a prophet, prophesied in Isaiah, and of course, even more specifically in Malachi. He's Jesus' cousin. Now, I don't know how close you are with your family, but if you were to learn someone that you knew, first of all, that you loved was dead, how do you react to that? Now, go beyond that. If you realize that his death was a sure tale sign that, the, that you're next, how do you respond to that? And what we read then is Jesus wants some time alone, wouldn't you? He's not going to bail on his disciples, his specific 12, but he really wants away from the crowds. But it's even worse than that because his disciples are work-worn and they haven't eaten in quite a while themselves. Which, by the way, I think is part of the motivation as they look at this, is they recognize the hunger because they haven't eaten either. So Jesus is trying to draw these boys away. And he looks at the boys, and I could just kind of get this, and pr- forgive me for sort of filling in the blanks, but again, don't just believe me. Search the scriptures out. Somewhere in all of this, can you see Jesus sitting with these guys and going, where can we get away? Where do we get away from this? This madness. And you kind of know that. We live in London. You know, I mean, where are those places where one, you've just had one of those days? Where, you know, is there some place that's sort of quiet still? Where you can get away from all of this. The, you know, the, the sirens that pierce your ears when they go by. The crazy drunk guy that somehow always seems to show up when you need a moment of solace. You know, those kind of things. So you can imagine Jesus turns to them and he goes, Hey, you guys need some rest and I really need some prayer. Let's hop on a boat. Let's go somewhere. And it does tell us, by the way, at least three of these guys are from Bethsaida. We know that because, for instance, Philip, and then we get three of the brothers as well. Now, the reason I say that is, is when Jesus turns to these guys and says, where should we go? I could see them going, oh, I know this really quiet place. Let's go there. So they hop in a boat, which I remind you is the workplace for at least a quarter of the disciples here. And they start heading over to this deserted place. The problem is what the scriptures tell us in the other three gospels is the people already know. Somewhere down the line, the paparazzi have been hanging out and they, get the, they catch wind of where Jesus is going. And they not only run, but they get there ahead of him. So here's Jesus dealing with the death of someone that he loves, dealing with the reality of his own eminent murder, trying to get his guys away before they faint on him. And he's just trying to get some form of rest in it all. And while all of this is happening, just trying to get a moment, a solace somewhere, he gets over to this place, and there is a multitude of people again. And according to this, at least 5,000 men, and assumedly their family. So that puts us at roughly fifteen to 20,000 people. That's not a quiet, deserted place. But what we do read, though, is that Jesus, when he looks out and he sees them, he has compassion. Now, I've got to tell you, that makes Jesus an inspiration in and of himself to me right there alone. I could learn so much from just that one moment. Because, I mean, this is the same Jesus who has infinite power. 
Now, if it were me and you could be thankful I'm not Jesus and I'm really clear that I'm not, and you should be really clear on that too. It's like I would do kind of something where it's like, all right, everybody pass up, you know, or whatever, and just let them all just drop or disappear or relocate them all. Hey, Philip was, you know, was relocated to Azotus. How about if he just says, all right, all you guys are going to like France for 20 minutes, you know, or whatever, just so we can get the moment away. And he doesn't do anything like that. He looks at them and what he sees, it tells us, is he looks and he sees sheep. He doesn't just see people, and he doesn't just see needs. Now, what if it were me? And, and, and as a pastor, you've you got to know the word pastor just means shepherd. What would it be like when I walk out on the streets, especially in a place like Camden, you know, where everyone's kind of on display, and, and I look, and I, and I don't see sort of, you know, oh, that's the, you know, that's the goth. That's the pretend goth. You know, that's the pretend punk with the Lee press on, you know, and mohawk or whatever. If I saw sheep, because that's what Jesus saw. But he didn't just see sheep. He saw sheep that were like they had no shepherd. So in other words, they were aimless, wandering, helpless sheep. And he looks at this, and in a moment like this, Jesus is like, this is just no time for me to have me time. Of all the people in the world, of all of the excuses, think of the amounts of the things that could happen to us that are infinitely less than this. I don't think any of you, I don't know you all very well, but I don't think any of you have ever had a moment where you're like, well, I'm facing imminent death, I could use a little me time right now. But Jesus, with the reality that all of the, I mean, and to me, if I were Jesus, and again, I'm not, but if, if it were me, I think that the big issue would be the fact that all the sins of the world are going to be put on my shoulders, and somewhere in all of this, I'm going to break fellowship with the Father that I've had fellowship with since eternity past. That would be even a heavier thing than just being tortured to death. But he looks and he sees these people, and according to the other three Gospels, he heals them, and then he teaches them about the kingdom. And so now here we are at the sea, John takes us back to the sea. He's a fisherman. I remind you, the writer of this gospel. So this means this is his workplace. Galilee, in a simple sense, is his hood. And it's not just him, Andrew and Peter, his business partners. They're from Bethsaida, this place, along with Philip. That means that at least a third of the uh, 12 are from this area. At least a quarter of them are fishermen that work on this workplace. And the sea is the key. Now, I'm the kind that I don't take anything for granted when I look at Scripture. And look at verse 1 with me. He tells us after these things. Jesus has just the, dealt with this growing tension because he healed a guy on the Sabbath who was at the pool of Bethesda, uh, Bethesda the house of mercy. And uh, he's had to defend himself with five testimonies. And Jesus, we read here in verse one, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, perhaps you don't want to read it. And I'll get into a little detail on a few of these things. I just don't want to lose the forest for the trees. But this particular sea has four names. Uh, and they're all listed in scripture, by the way. The Sea of Chinneret, uh, we see uh, the Sea of Gennesaret, we see here the Sea of Galilee and the Sea of Tiberias. Now, John is writing to an audience that clearly isn't tr- uh, traditionally Hebrew for the most part because he could say Sea of Galilee and everyone would get that. But several times in scripture, he's gonna say, this is what they said, oh, and let me translate that for you because you might not get it. For instance, they call him Messiah, and he goes, oh, you guys probably don't know. That means Christ, for those of you Greek speakers. That's kind of the idea here. So he's really trying to help us out. So why would John even tell us it was the Sea of Galilee if he knew that we weren't gonna get it? And he's gonna say, oh, by the way, that's the Sea of Tiberias, in case you know. Well, God loves to write these little things in here. And if you're the kind like me, I love to take the scripture for a walk. I take this, and I just go walk and say, all right, God, why this? for instance. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Israel. I know a couple of you have. Because you've been there with me. The Sea of Galilee is a fundamental aspect of the entire life of Israel. First of all, I don't know if you're aware of this, but it's 70% of their drinking water. Now, interesting as it is, by the way, it's roughly, at its, at its, on, its, on its heyday, it's roughly 13 miles by 8 miles. That kind of gives you an idea. Now, the reason the two names that are not listed, Sea of Chinneret and Sea of Gennesaret, actually are the same word. Chinneret is Hebrew, Gennesaret is Greek, and it means harp. And the reason is the sea itself is shaped like one. Now, when I, because I have these instruments, and as a musician, one of the things I notice is when you see things geared towards a harp, it's a very intimate instrument. It's not a loud instrument. It isn't like there's like heavy metal harp players, even to this day, although I'm sure there's probably one in London somewhere. But it's a very intimate instrument. And for those of us who remember the Sea of Galilee, it is an extremely intimate place. It is a place where you get so quiet when the sun rises. The only place I can ever get up, for whatever reason, to see the sunrise every day I'm there but it gets so quiet, you can hear the wind move underneath a mud duck as it flies by. I mean, it gets that quiet. You can hear your thoughts. And when there is this place where you see it listed as the Sea of Kinneret or the Sea of Gennesaret, 
you could see there's a focus on this intimacy factor. I get that. That's why he would mention it that way. So why these? Galilee is the region. Galil means circle because the region is, in essence, relatively circular. A lot of area, for instance, things like Capernaum fit in there. Uh, the area of, we know, Cana, for instance, is in Galilee. Now, this particular sea here, again, fed by, by, for what it's worth, it's fed by three tributaries. I love this because to, to the Middle Eastern mind, water is life. And life fits into one body of water. Ironically, the lowest freshwater pool or lake in all of the world, for what it's worth. Uh, it's roughly, for what it's worth, about 209 meters below sea level. And it travels then 156 miles, roughly the distance between here and Exeter, down to the Dead Sea, which is the most saline body of water in all of Scripture. Isn't that kind of an odd thought? Or actually, on, in the, on the globe. In other words, to give you an idea, it's 34.2% salt down there at the Dead Sea, which is, to give you an idea, that's 9.6 times more saline than the Atlantic, if you were to go down, for instance, to Exeter. It's so thick and full of these minerals, as salt included, you can't drown in it. You float. Even the, even the skinniest and scrawniest of you are going to float there. And they say, by the way, but don't, don't drink it. Don't drink the water there. No. Consider this. Why does it get so saline on one side so that nothing can live, but on the other side it's the place where all life is? Because there's no outlet at the end of the Dead Sea. It sits, it sits literally on a tectonic plate and then sits at the lowest part here, 430 and a half meters below sea level. And there, there's no place for that water to go but evaporate. And so it turns into salt. I mean, basically, all that's left is the salt content. Now, don't miss this. On the western side of a clock, if you will, the western side of the Sea of Galilee, the Jewish part, because the eastern side would be that of where the man of the tombs, for instance, was. That's the Roman side. There is only one Roman city. The rest of it's Jewish. And it is the place where everyone comes to get life. It's the place where they go to get their water to this day. I understand why he calls it the Sea of Galilee. Because it's the place where people come to get life. But he also calls it the Sea of Tiberias. Tiberias is the only Roman city on the western side, roughly at about 9 o'clock, if you were to look at it like a clock. And it is built on a graveyard, based in every way on Roman principles, and it was a place that was avoided by all Jewish people for the most part. But I get the idea here that John's writing to people that aren't predominantly Jewish, or they wouldn't have to be told. So what's the difference? Why does he give us both? Now forgive me for sort of belaboring this, but I just want to get a point across that somewhere in it you get this idea that you went to, get to the Sea of Galilee for life, but you kind of went to Tiberias for everything else. If you wanted to go for sin, you really couldn't go to Capernaum for that for the most part, but you certainly could go to Tiberias for that. And the reason I say that is it's really going to, in essence, preempt the whole chapter. In essence, we're salting our meat before we cook it. Because the idea here is he's like, you get the idea that this is where we go for life, but you need to know where do we go for everything else. And that's the whole point of the chapter. People are going to come to Jesus, and they're going to come to Jesus for life, but they're going to realize ultimately Jesus is everything they need. Do you know, in this chapter alone, more people are going to leave Jesus. More people are going to bail on the school of Jesus. He's going to lose, in essence, what appears to be 90% to 95% of his entire congregation over a single message. Do you realize that? And for what it's worth, just so you might find it fun to look up, it's John 6, 66, or 666, where they leave. Not for what it's worth. Consider that. Now, Let's dig into our text, but I wanted to sort of start us with this. Jesus is dealing with the death of his cousin. He's dealing with the imminent death uh, of himself. He's got a group of guys that are kind of yutzes, they're doofuses that are his disciples, and Jesus now is walking with them, trying to get them away before they pass out from not being able to eat. And now there's this huge crowd that showed up, and Jesus doesn't even get that. We read in verse 2 that a great multitude followed him, not because he was going to feed them. They hadn't read the chapter ahead. Because he had done all these miracles, and that, was, and that was it. And you get the idea here that people were bellowing up to the human, po- the human hospital. That's what Jesus was, and they had their needs. They bring their sick people, and they're like, hey, this guy heals. I don't care if the guy wants a day off. I'm bringing my sick people, which is really going to be interesting because Jesus had already said in the last chapter, man, I'm never taking a break, and that's a good thing. I'm glad Jesus doesn't take a day off. Jesus, we read in verse 3, went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now, it is important to note the posture here. We do things completely opposite in, in the, on the Western world. In the Eastern world, even to this day in places like China, you'll find a lot of times the teacher sits 
When the teacher sits, he's about to teach. The students stand. I think that's one way of keeping them from falling asleep. It's kind of the idea. But you go to a place like China, every time I go there, they'll say something like, if you teach for less than six hours, I will be angry. And I'm like, are you kidding me? No. Some of you aren't as familiar with this, but that's actually a very, those are very pleasing words for me to hear. Uh, especially because I just love teaching his word. But hear me in this. They stand the entire time. They stand there. They, you know, they shift legs once in a while. But basically, no one even runs off to the toilet. And we're talking hundreds of people that just stand there. When the teacher stands after he's taught, it is application time. And you'll see this in Israel to this day. A rabbi will sit. His students will stand around him. He'll teach some principle. God bless you. And I mean that word for word. And then he'll say, go and learn what this means. Jesus has said it a couple of times, for instance, we'll see in Matthew. And then they'll go and do something to try to develop the principle. And you'll see kids rolling big logs with little sticks as learning a principle that had just been taught by Rabboni. And that's kind of the idea. And you go, oh, and at that point, he's not, you know, he's sitting because he's letting them do their thing and he's sitting there watching them kind of work it out. No, don't miss that because that's what we have here. Now, in verse 2 it says, A great multitude followed him because they saw the signs and wonders that he performed. But Jesus went up on a mountain and he sat and his disciples were there. Now, that, that, by the way, you may miss this, but it delineates between two groups of people that Jesus is with. There's a multitude of people who come with needs. Sick people, they're hungry. They've got, and they, they've, come, and they, they've come with something with an agenda on their mind. It can happen here at church. You show up because you've got something you need to work out. You know, you're, something's freaking you out, life is overwhelming you, it's heavy on your shoulders, and you came here and you're like, I've come here and this, you know, it's like Father Christmas, please deal with this. On the other side of it, Jesus has disciples. Disciple, mathitikos in the Greek, it just means students. So the difference is the moment that Jesus sits, you know that he's going to teach, I'm sorry, when he stands, you know he's going to teach. And you can tell at that point, disciples come to him because they want to hear him teach and not just come for whatever the thing is that they've come for. And yet, at this moment, Jesus is sitting, and I get the idea that means that something's about to be applied. So he's going to be looking at his students, and I'm going to go, okay, they're going to be applying something. Well, and that's exactly what Jesus is doing here, isn't it? Now, we read in verse, three, or verse 4 that it was Passover. As it was Passover, the feast of the Jews, it was near two quick things, and again, we're getting this, so this whole thing kind of weaves together. Passover is one of three required feasts that every Jewish uh, able-bodied person was required to do. You know, Passover was the first of them. Pesach was the celebration of freedom, the, the slaughter of the lamb, the death of the firstborn son that got Israel out of Egypt in the first place in the roughly the 1400s through Moses. Then 50 days later, the word 50, Pentecost, and that's where we get the word, uh, there was the celebration of the first great harvest, and at the end of the season, in the seventh month, it was the celebration of the last great harvest called Sukkot, or Tabernacles. So it's the first of those feasts. It was the feast, by the way, where there's a whole, to this day, you could buy a thing called a Haggadah. In essence, it's kind of like a Passover for dummies, if that makes sense, you know, sort of a DYI. And so it really helps you kind of prepare things. And the reason I say that, and I'll, we'll develop that next week, because the whole idea of it is everything that's being done up to chapter 13 prepares you for the Passover that Jesus is going to die at, where the Lamb of God dies and the firstborn son dies. Jesus does that so that we could go free. The whole thing's been leading us up to that since the 1400s BC. Here we read, though, it's a feast of the Jews, which tells us, though it should be focusing on the Lord, it's not. And it's interesting because one of the main parts of Passover is the bread. The reason I say that is, that's the point. He points us to the Passover, and then Jesus is going to ask questions about the bread. It seems appropriate. So Jesus lifted up his eyes. Verse 5, and he sees this great multitude, and he turns to Philip. Two other characters are going to be listed here, Philip and Andrew. And he says to Philip, where? That's his question. Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Notice, it's Passover, and the question is bread. Now, ultimately, you may be aware of that. Jesus makes seven I am, distinct I am statements in the Gospel of John. And there are seven, by the way, for what it's worth, unique miracles listed in the Gospel of John. Uh, not unique to other Gospels, but unique in regards to each one tethers to one of his claims. And the first of the statements he'll make is, I'm the bread of life in this chapter. But first, he's going to show us a miracle to prove he is. And he turns to this guy, Andrew. I'm sorry, he turns to this guy, Philip, and he says, so where are we going to find the bread for this, guys? Now, here you are, you're exhausted. Jesus is already emotionally distraught over John. You've now traveled across the getaway and all these people are here. 
The other gospels say that the disciples look and say, Jesus, send these guys away. And they're trying to sound real, you know, benevolent. Well, because they're going to just pass out if they stay here because there's no food for them, you know. I mean, you can get the idea here that they're sounding so kind. But Jesus looks at Philip and he goes, so where are we going to get bread for these guys? Now, for what it's worth, Philip is your fix-it guy among the twelve. Every time you kind of see Philip, he's kind of doing something to kind of fix it. Uh, by the way, he is the one who invites Nathaniel in John 1.45. But he's the one when the Greeks come and they say, we wish to see Jesus, he's the one who's supposed to go and get that done. And he's the one when he says in John 14.8, Jesus, oh, if you could just show us the Father, that'll be all we really need. In other words, he's kind of the guy that's like, let's get her done. So it makes sense that Jesus is going to turn to Philip. Hey, Philip, fix it, fella. Now, if you're one of those kind of people that's a get her done kind of guy or gal, You can find that Jesus will ask you questions like this often. And what we learn from the text is just because Jesus asks a question doesn't mean he doesn't know the answer. And he's given you a chance to actually show faith. Now what's clear is, by the way, Philip's done the math. Have you noticed that here? I mean, there may be other guys. If you ask Peter, he'd probably be just like, I don't know. But Philip's like, you know, I've already done the math on this. And what I've noticed is if we could actually take a year's salary, a a denarii, by the way, is a day's salary. If we could take a year's salary, basically, everyone could get at best a nibble, and these people are hungry. But Philip's already done the math on that. So let's put that into perspective. The average salary, by the way, in this area, annually is roughly 40,000 pounds a year. Now, I don't know who's making that, but somebody's doing pretty good. And so imagine someone going, and and Jesus, now, by the way, he's not the money, does anyone know who's actually the money carrier for Jesus? Does anyone know? In John 12, it tells us Judas Iscariot was the guy who carried the money. He was the bank. But Jesus isn't turning to Judas, is he? You'd think if it was really about buying something, he'd turn to Judas and say, Judas, how much money we have because we've got to feed these people. But he's not because the issue wasn't dealing with Judas. The issue is dealing with Mr. Fix-It. And by the way, I'm kind of one of these guys, so I get this. So he's like, how are we going to fix this? And he's like, well, don't worry, Jesus, I've already done the math, and the math says, according to my calculations, we just don't have it. We ain't got it. I mean, you know, I've been sitting with Judas, we've done had a little board meeting, we've done sort of a revenue search on this, and we're like, I think we're just going to have to sell Peter. I mean, you know, you get the idea. But Jesus is asking, because he's giving him a chance to come up with a better answer. He says he did this to test him because he already knew what he would do. It says in verse 7, though, Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for, it, for every one of them to have a little. And I, and I get this because he's asking, where are we going to go to fix this? That's the question, right? Not how. Hear me on that. If you're a fix-it person like me, the question he's asking isn't, how are you going to fix this, Philip? The question is, where are you going to go to get the need met? And that's a very different question altogether, isn't it? And I realize sometimes I could be more acquainted with the what or the how than I am with the where. The only where that's going to be able to solve this is Jesus, and he's standing right next to him. The actual solution is standing there asking the question. So where are you going to go? And let me just burn this in your heart for a second, please, with me. You've got a problem, whatever the problem is. And Jesus looks at you and he says, so where are you going to go? Well, that person burned me. Where are you going to go? My boss is acting mental. Where are you going to go? I can't even seem to find a job. Where are you going to go? I can't seem to forgive that person. Where are you going to go? Life is so on top of me. I can't get past this depression thing. I just, it's overwhelming. Where are you going to go? Because I understand that question is so important and we miss it. He's looking at Philip, and the need is obvious. It isn't like the need doesn't exist. It's obvious, and it's staring him in the face through, fi- through 5,000 men's faces, and then there's some. And he's looking, he's going, so, it's not like I don't see the problem, Philip. I see the problem. You see the problem. Where are you going to go to take care of it? Well, the most natural means is to go pay for it, and I don't have it. My natural resources are insufficient. The funds of my own person 
are insufficient to meet this need. I can't do it. I've got a kid that keeps me up all night. How am I going to not go crazy? Where? How am I going to not go crazy? Where are you going to go? Life just seems so crazy, I can't even seem to find an answer. Where are you going to go? Philip, where are you going to go? Well, I know where I can't go. I'm real familiar with that. I can't go to my bank. It ain't working. I can't go to my resources. It's not enough. But then another guy shows up in the scene. The fix-it guy can't fix it. Andrew now comes into the situation. He's also, we read here, one of his disciples. He's always, I mean, I don't know about you, but it would be rough to be Andrew because he's often mentioned as Simon Peter's brother. Uh, That's a rough shadow to stand behind. But when we look in Scripture, we realize Andrew's kind of Andrew the inviter. When Andrew first discovers, when John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, Andrew goes and finds his brother Peter, and he says, at the time, Simon. (coughs) Maybe you're aware of the fact Peter is actually Simon's surname. Did you know that? It says Simon who surnamed Peter. And he goes, bro, I think we've, loose paraphrase, bro, I think we found the Messiah. You need to go check him out. Here he's going to bring a child. And in that John 12 text where they go to Philip, same two guys, by the way, they go to Philip and these Greeks say, hey, we want to see Jesus. You know how Philip solves the problem? He goes to Andrew. And he says, hey, these guys want to see Jesus. You're the inviter guy. What do you want to do? And Andrew goes and tells Jesus with, with uh, Philip. Now, which one of you has this kind of faith? Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, hey, there's a lad here, which tells me he must be Irish. It's the only one I know he still uses a term like that. Is a lad here who has five barley loaves. Those are little biscuits. Those are the kind that, are, by, the, by the way, they're a poor man's lunch. And two small fish. Small fish like herring that would be sort of something that would be salted so it doesn't decay so quick. But what are they among so many? Now, isn't it sort of strange that he even brought this kid in the first place? And what part of you thinks, oh, there's 5,000 people. Let's, t- let's take a kid's lunch. But he looks, and somewhere down the line, it's like while Philip's trying to solve the problem, you know what the strange thing is? Andrew actually is kind of going to the where. He's kind of taking a look at the resources. Andrew says, oh, no, no, Philip looks and he goes, all of the resources we have isn't enough. And, and Andrew just kind of looks, and he just kind of looks and he goes, well, this is what we have, but I'm taking it to the where because I know that the where is the answer anyways. So, hey, this is what we've got, Jesus. What do you want to do with it? There's the difference. You know, I'm weak. I'm going to give you what little strength I have, but I know you're the where. These are my resources and these are the needs i gotta lay, I got to lay it before you, Jesus, because this is, you're the where. Man, I'm exhausted. Life is crazy. i got to lay it before you. i got to give you my life because you're the where in this. And, I, and, it, it isn't, and what I've learned is as long as you're the where, the what is really less important, the, the, the gravity and the depth and the surplus or the minimal amount of what I have is so inconsequential when I know who the where is. But if I don't know who the where is, it's a whole lot bigger of a deal. And he kind of looks at him and goes, I don't know what in the world you can do with this, Jesus, but at least this is what I want to bring to you. This is, uh, you know, so somewhere down the line, it doesn't appear as if Andrew has any food. By the way, you may be aware of the fact that because he's such an inviter in Scripture, there's a brother Andrew ministry, and the whole thing's geared on the idea that they should be inviting people to Christ. It comes from this fellow right here, this lad. And he looks and he goes, hey, Jesus, I know you were asking, by the way, did you notice Jesus didn't turn to Andrew and go, well, Philip failed, Andrew, what do you have? But he's like, he's asking Philip, and, and Andrew's inserting himself into the situation. Hey, way to go, Andrew. As if Andrew were actually answering the question for Philip, where are you going to go? Philip says, I don't know. I know where I can't go. And Andrew goes, hey, Jesus. Here's a kid with a lunch. Bringing it to you, Jesus, because you're the where. What do you want to do with it? Would I be embarrassed to bring this little to Jesus? I would be unless I'm sure he's the where. And I'm so busy trying to make bigger of me because if I can make bigger of me, then maybe there'd be enough in the purse for whatever the need is. 
But have you learned yet? God has this habit of putting you in places you're just never going to be enough, so you'll learn that he's the where. And I hate those places. I hate those places because I don't like feeling like I'm not enough. I don't like feeling like, hey, if I could have just tried harder, nope, it doesn't matter how hard I try, it's just not going to happen. Somewhere down the line, Jesus, I don't need your help. I need you to take this thing over. And you kind of know the difference. When you're like, Jesus, I'm almost there. Can I get a little nudge? Jesus is like, the amount you've gotten is because I give you that much ability alone anyways. We're not negligent to offer. But we give what we have to him. So notice what Jesus says. Verse 10, what's the command Jesus tells them? What is it saying? Believe it or not, that was actually a question. What's that? Make the people sit down. So wait a minute, what happens when people sit down and Jesus is standing? What does that mean? Yeah, don't say it. He's about to what? He's about to, he's about to teach. Yeah, he's about to teach. And now we could miss that, but he's like, you need to sit down. Now let me ask you, look at the rest of the text room because it's only a couple of verses. Who gets fed? It's in verse 11, just to help you out here. Who was given the food? What's that? Yes, everyone who was seated. You don't miss that. Because it's like, all right, we've got 5,000 guys and their families. You guys have a responsibility. Make them rest. Good luck with that. Now, we don't know how many disciples we're talking about. We do know of these 12 that are listed but we read many of his disciples are going to walk away, so there's a whole lot more than 12. We know there's a time where he's going to send out 70, so we know there's going to be that as well. Here, there could, be, there could be, I mean, who knows how many of these are that, but he's looking, he's like, look at this is the part I need you to do. What I need you to do first is I need you to get these people to rest, to sit down and let me do what I'm going to do. That's what they've got to do. And in the end of it all, what if you were one of those people like, Psh, I'm not sitting down. Psh, stupid, why in the world? I'm hungry. I'm too hungry to sit. You know, guess what? You're going to stay hungry because you're not sitting. Jesus is like, look it. I'll feed anyone who sits. If you're willing to rest, I'm willing to be the where. But if you really trust that I'm the where, you'll actually rest. You will actually rest. But you've got to trust me. Now, we don't read anywhere that any one of these 5,000 people outside of this is aware of this lunch that Jesus has in his hand. Only these, this small group, at least we know of two guys that are aware of it, it seems like, and that's Philip and Andrew. So the only two that we're aware of at the moment, and the kid, of course. So Jesus has got this, he's got this plan from the beginning before this kid was coming, which means he already knew the kid was going to come because he already knew what he was going to do. Did he put it on the heart? of Andrew to bring this kid? I don't know. I do know this. The, the God who made this world around us created a place that was big and grassy and flat so we could feed them here. Do you ever think about how God plans ahead? I mean, 6,000 years ago or so, God says, as we make this earth, we shape the earth, or after the flood, let's shape this spot, let's make it nice and flat, let's grow some grass, because my son's going to come soon and this place is going to be a big buffet. And they've been planning for it. And at this moment, we're freaking out because people don't have food and we don't know that God's been preparing that spot before he made the world. He already had this spot planned. I love how my God knows what he's doing. Yeah, well, they've never, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think the question is, do you think there was a lack of faith? I think it's hard to put trust in something God's never done before because we hadn't seen it. You know what's really funny, though? After this 5,000, Jesus is going to do this again with 4,000, and they're going to fail at the second time. <laughs> and to me, that's even a greater lack of faith because this time, at least, you're like, I have no idea what he's going to do. But by the, t by the time we see this come around a second time, you kind of be like, hmm. Yeah, I, I think I know what he's going to do here. But let's face it. 
bills come in and you do not have the resources and somehow God pays them all and bills come in again and you don't have the resources, do you just rest and go, I'm sure God's going to take care of it? I mean, we, the only reason I say that is at least I'm speaking transparently. I'm good at failing that test too. Okay, so get this. So they're sitting down. Jesus, we read in verse 11, by the way, that Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them. Now notice, by the way, Jesus thanked the Father for the little there was. That is not a London mindset. We thank God for lots. We thank God for abundance. Because we forget where the where is. We think that the things we have are actually the where. Isn't that kind of where Philip was? He's like, the where was the purse, and the purse isn't big enough. And so I'm bumming because we ain't got it. But if I knew Jesus was the where, I could be thankful for the little. How many people does God need to change the world? And does he need 7,000 people? Funny, because throughout Scripture, he always seems to raise up an individual at a time that actually kind of has a spine that really listens to the Lord and does what he says. But Jesus took this and he thanked the Father. Imagine you were the kid with the lunch and you give it to Jesus. And then Jesus goes, first of all, Dad, I want to thank you. Thank you for these five beautiful biscuits and these two tiny little fish. I think he was the only person in that place at that moment thanking the Father for those things. I mean, if you were the kid and you had any conscience, could you really eat that in front of everyone else while they weren't eating? Well, not at least in front of them. So to get this, so he, first of all, he, he thanks the Father, and he, thanks the, and he does likewise with the fish. But, he, and, but notice, the point is the bread. And it says, Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them. Now, the word distributed, by the way, dio uh, didomi. And didomi, by the way, literally just means deal out. The easiest example we have of that, to be honest, although it's a very sorry one, is a guy that's doing that with cards. It's kind of just dishing them out to each person. Or if you will, you work at a soup kitchen and everyone kind of comes and you're kind of flopping it on everyone's plate. Well, that's kind of the idea here. And that's the word Jesus. By the way, that tells us that Jesus is the one. It's, it, is, it's, it seems to be multiplying in Jesus' hands is the idea. Not like he's giving it to you when you're like, whoa, how did that get so heavy? Jesus is just, he just seems to be breaking it off and that's kind of the idea. And as he's breaking it off, he's just, it's kind of like, keeps growing back is the idea. And he just kind of keeps handing it out to all of his disciples, all right? Now, how long do you think Jesus has to do this before 5,000 guys and their families get fed? How long do you think it takes before you're like, this is one of the weirdest miracles I've ever been involved in? And they've watched a lot of Jesus do a lot of really cool things, but they've never seen anything like this. In the Gospel of John, by the way, he does another miracle that involves food. Does anyone remember what it is? It's the first miracle he does. He turns water to wine. What you find interesting, the two food miracles we see here are based around bread and wine. Hmm. I think that's taking us somewhere. Anyways, with all of that said, Jesus goes and everybody, and it tells us here, notice, I, I don't like to miss these things. It tells us in verse 11, he distributed to the disciples, the disciples to those sitting down, You've got to have to rest to get this. And likewise the fish, as much as they wanted. Notice it doesn't say as much as they needed. I do find that interesting. The word want, by the way, is the word fellow. It's the word we get from, we usually get will, like God's will is this word. It literally means what God wants or literally what pleases him. In other words, they ate as much as they made, as long as they were happy to eat, they ate. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been to a Brazilian barbecue. I know some have because some have eaten me under the table there. But it's like where they just bring barbecued meat to the table. I'm, I, somehow I have a vision that that's kind of like heaven. But uh, it, at least that part of it. But in that, you get to the point where you finally have to do, like you betray the part, you have to betray your mouth because your stomach's going to explode and go, I really just can't eat anymore. I Believe me, I'm sweating grease at this point and I'm so happy. And the reason I say that is, is that the word we'll find here in verse 12, it says they were filled, by the way, for what it's worth. And uh, uh, me. Uh, it is a word that simply means, by the way, to be glutted. In other words, Jesus actually fed till these people couldn't eat anymore. He didn't just be like Jesus is like, well, I'm going to give you just enough to survive. To be honest, what's clear in this is there's some left over. Have you noticed, by the way, that Jesus will always give you an abundance, but it's not for you to hoard. It's for you to share. 
I love the fact he gives me love in abundance because therefore I'm not supposed to be the end of it. I'm supposed to be the one that dishes it out. The idea that you could come thirsty, but if you trust in him, out of you will torrent living water. And the idea was is you may come thirsty, but in the end you do more than that. You help quench other people's thirst. Well, here Jesus looks and he feeds these people till they cannot eat any more. And when they were completely filled, verse 12, then Jesus says to his students, notice not to the rest of the people, but to his students, you have one more job. I want you to gather what remains. Now, I don't know what that would look like. I mean, you're glutted. I mean, at that point, you've got to loosen your sash, you know. Now you've got these sort of baby, you know, these food babies. Everyone's kind of laying there kind of in a semi-comatose state. They're all kind of happy and miserable at the same time. And there's like pieces of bread lying all over the place. And these guys are going to go, oh, I'm just going to take the rest of that. I'm going to take the rest of that. And they're going to put these in these baskets. And he says, and I, I find this interesting. He's like, gather up the fragments that remain. By the way, what's going to be clear is that it doesn't seem like there's any fish left over, which I don't know about you. I'm actually kind of thankful for if I was one of these. But he says, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing is lost. And I do like this. The idea here is that no part of a miracle, no part of a miracle is inconsequential. When God does it and there's these other things that, these things that kind of leave over, in the end of it all, these guys are going to be able to go and take doggy bags with them. They're going to take a little to take away, and they're going to have these 12 baskets. There's two different words for basket. One of them is kafinas. That's the word that's here, and that's sort of a, like a, that's the kind of basket that we would say is like a picnic basket. The other basket, by the way, would be the one that Paul has let down in on when he's trying to, after he's converted. And by the way, you couldn't do that in a, in a picnic basket, and that's sort of more of like a giant basket, like you might see on a balloon, a hot air balloon. Anyways, with that, with that said, hear me on this, because we're almost done here. The idea is quite simple. Jesus looks and he goes, I don't want any of this to get left over. I don't want this to be food for birds. I want this to be food for us. Because later on, we're going to sit after this and we're going to feast on this miracle. But not forever. But this miracle is not just for this moment. We're going to be able to go and sit after all of this and eat together and go, remember how amazing that was? How cool was that? But I got to think for a moment and think, though the focus is on bread, how weird would it be for the four fishermen? They saw these tiny little fish. And then Jesus went and fed everyone with fish too. I'm thinking my whole life, I've been trying to get a, a haul like this. And this guy took two herring and he fed 5,000 men and their families. He fed a small village, or actually a large village. He fed, he fed enough people with something that I would have thrown back in the water is bait. And I think, wow. And then Jesus goes, now, let's go see what's left over. Let's gather it, boys. And they come in to gather up all of this, and they're like, wow, we have like 12 baskets of this left over. And he goes, good. Here's the problem. The people, in our last verse, when the people look at this, they're like, Wait a minute, Deuteronomy promised us that when Moses said that God will raise up a prophet like him and we must hear him. And they're like, I think this is the guy. Which, by the way, it is true. The problem is the verse that follows, which is where we'll go next week, where they perceive this uh, and Jesus realizes that the, what they do to apply it is they're going to try to make Jesus king by force. And Jesus is like, wait a minute, where in Deuteronomy does it say when this guy actually is the prophet that was promised that you're now to go to thrust him into political position? you're missing the whole point. If you think that the greatest deliverance is from Rome, boy, you are missing it. Now, let's bring this to close. Let's apply this and bring it to close. First of all, I don't know what battles you're going through right now, but chances are there are battles that you're facing. Chances are one way or another, they're cloaked under the cape of life. Whether that be something in resource, whether that be something in regards to circumstances, whether that be in regards to relationships, and somewhere in all of that, you're just trying to figure out what in the world to do. And you're like, how am I going to make it through this? And Jesus looks at you. You know what he says? Where? You're asking the wrong question. How are you going to do this? Where? Who are you turning to for it? Because you know this. If you don't have the resources, but you're trying with them, and you're the where, or it's the where, you'll be spent, it will be spent, and you'll be no better off for it. You'll just be exhausted now and still in the same place. Jesus goes, I'm your where. What we're going to find ultimately is Jesus will turn to this and say, I'm the bread of life. The bread you were looking for. Remember, Jesus had asked Philip, 
where are we going to find bread? And then Jesus is going to say, uh, I'm the bread. You know where we're going to go? Go here. That's where you need to go. So if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, let me say, this starts with this. That we need to go and, and take inventory from him and say, is there something in my life that I've been missing because I've been busy in the wrong wares? And you know what? Because, man, you've got stress lines. You're older than you should be. Your body's wearing, wearing down because of it. And all of that's testimony. You're in the wrong way. But we read that Jesus did bring thanks to the Father. That's a simple testimony because we know that that same blessing is the same one we do. I believe next week is uh, communion. Where he says, blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread up from the earth. The idea of that, anyways. The testimony was more than just breaking bread. Because Matthew would tell us he broke it and blessed it. It's that the bread came up from the earth. That was one of the miracles about bread. Is it didn't fall like it used to with Moses' day, that now it rose up. It started by coming down from heaven. The first bread we see, by the way, was the bread that comes down from heaven in regards to the nation Israel. But ultimately, it has to come up from the earth now, and that's the thankful part of it, is God brings rain, it grows up through grain, and then, of course, it becomes bread. And that's what they thank God for. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who gives us bread up from the earth. And understand in the same way that was our Jesus, who descended first from heaven to save us. Because of our guilt, the question is, where are you going to go with it? Are you going to just try to be a better person? But that doesn't diminish or remove the guilt you've already done. All it does is basically the same thing that a mortician does. Once someone's dead, they can put makeup on them, trying to look alive, they're still dead. And we're becoming morticians to our own guilt that makes us dead before God. However, the bread that came down from heaven, Jesus, the living God, Son of God and God the Son, came down from heaven and died on a cross, was broken so that we could be made whole. And when he died on that cross, your sin and my sin was paid for. And when he was buried, he had already said before that, who brings bread up from the earth. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread up from the earth. And the promise was already there. And on the third day, just like scripture promised, he rose again and offers us a brand new life now no longer under the dominion of our own sin and no longer steeped in the guilt of our own failures. Jesus has paid for it all and makes us new. Have you said yes to that, Jesus? I'm not just saying have you gone to church, but let's face it, going to church doesn't make you a Christian as much as going to a McDonald's doesn't make you a cheeseburger. You can get one there, but there's a choice to be made. You don't get married because you just look at someone and smile. There's a choice to be made. And he's paid the bill, but he's asking your permission. Have you said yes? If not, I'm going to give you that choice. But if you have, then let's just take it all to the Lord and be reminded who the where is so that peace could be where we could sit and rest. As we sang, we will be still and know that you are God right out of Psalm 46. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much for this beautiful text. I thank you for what you've spoken to us in it. I thank you, Lord, that John would take us, Jesus, that you ultimately would take us to this sea where everyone would belly up for life because of the water that it provides. While the Romans run to Tiberias to get the things that think make them Roman. And here, seeking a quiet place, you found none. And you would tell us, Lord, that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And here you are at an appropriate time to want some me time, some quiet time, some time to just get alone and pray. And yet the need so vast before you. Well, I confess to you. I confess to you, Lord, sometimes I'm much more acquainted with the vastness of my problems that I am with the infinity of who you are. 
And there may be mighty big issues, but you are almighty. And there may be big challenges, but you are infinite and eternal. From everlasting to everlasting. And nothing that ever bothers me, challenges me, or is a thorn in my flesh will in any way ever endure like that. It had a beginning. It will have an end. But you have never had, nor will ever have either. And your throne is from everlasting. Your mercy endures forever. Your love is everlasting. You've loved us with an everlasting love and drawn us with cords of loving kindness. Forgive us, God, when we forget that. And we hunch our backs and we furrow our brows and we get headaches and heartaches and we sigh and the world looks and we tell them the joy of you is our strength, but they don't see the joy. They see us burdened by the things of this world like they are and they don't see a difference. And yet you told us that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. But for that to happen, Jesus, you've got to be the where. Not just the what or the how, the where. You are the destination, not just the means to an end. You are our reward and our portion. Let us not forget that. And if you're not sure if you've ever said yes to Jesus, or you know you haven't, but today you know you need to, hear this prayer, and at the end, if you agree, I ask you to give a resounding amen, and what you're saying is, I agree. Let those words be my words, so be it in my life. And here's the prayer. God in heaven, I do stand before you guilty in my own sins. I'd love to pretend they don't exist, but they're there. But none of that surprises you, nor intimidates you or frightens you. You love me, and you want me anyways. You want me so bad that you're willing to pay the the fee for all of my crimes in my heart by sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins so that every wrong thing, thought, intended, felt, done, could be punished. All guilt punished. All shame vanquished. Buried, and just like your scripture promised, Jesus rose again to offer me new life as the architect of my reinvention, as the Lord of my life, and I say yes. Confessing Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I say yes. Have me now, I pray. I give you me. I give you the little of me. The loaves and fish that I am, I give them to you. And I say, make something beautiful with it. Bless it and bring it. Lord, whatever it is, as it's in your hands, as you are the wearer, bless it and use it to touch thousands, please. In Jesus' name, and if you agree, I ask you to say, Amen. God, you've heard our prayers. You know our hearts. Now, send us out of here with a restful heart, trusting that you are the where, and in that, we can be still and sit and let you minister as you desire. We give you all that we are. It doesn't have to be much, because the issue isn't the what. The issue is the where, and you're the where. So we give it to you and say, bless it. In Jesus' name.